I've heard really great things about your show, first of all, but I was looking over at your touring schedule, and it's it's kind of ridiculous. It looks like you're going to be in okay. Italy and then Turkey, United Kingdom, and Poland. That's immediately after Worcester. You've, I'm guessing you've sold enough albums, and you know why keep this relentless schedule? So this is uh, January. Uh, we'll begin our 17th year. Uh, of being on the road 250 days a year. And uh, and I just, I mean, I really think that if you, you know, if you're a nine-year-old kid and you pick up a truck and you were ever lucky enough to write down what your dream was, you know, and then it, it came true for me, you know. And it's a different thing. Like, it, you could be a pop star overnight. You can get, be a YouTube sensation or whatever that is. And, and it, but for adult music, for something like an instrumentalist, to be able to have the opportunity to tour like we do with the same incredible band all over the world, everyone's happy. It's just a real super fortunate situation I'm in, and I I don't ever look at it. You know, yes, I get up and get on a plane every day, but I never look at it. I look at it as like, man, I'm the luckiest absolute musician on the planet. Now, when you were nine or when you were, you know, 18 and and headed off to school or or whatever, did you have... Was this what you had in mind? Did you think, oh, my career, I'm going to be touring 250 nights a week playing these uh, no, big no, venues? No, no, no. no I, I always say it's the yellow brick road theory is that, you know, you just you take one step and, and you try to be as best as you can enamored with the most important thing. And that's kind of like sense of practice and, and discipline and self-worth, but also to to inspire or to impress the people right around you. You know, because that goes out into the world. Word of mouth, I guess, is a is a more stripped down way to say this. But like the word of mouth aspect is what makes musicians successful. And I started out playing in other people's bands, Paul Simon, Frank Sinatra, Buddy Rich, blah, 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 and that sort of thing. And then later on with Sting. And, and I, you know, I that was all word of mouth stuff. And it wasn't until you know, in my early 40s that I really got a a shot at having a solo career, you know, and that's all just put together over time. You don't really ever think when you're 20 that something like this today where I'm sitting is even in the in the cards, you know, because like I said, you know, for an instrumentalist, it's like 6 million times more difficult than, you know, your average pop singer. So uh, yeah, I just I had this really healthy dose of naivete, and it served me really well all those early years when I was struggling. Now, when you were uh, when you were starting out, I mean, the the name on the marquee was not your own. It was it was some big name, you know, Frank Sinatra or Sting yeah. or, or, or someone like that. Now that your name is up there, the big name on the marquee, do you feel like you have some kind of um, uh, obligation to help the people coming up that were in your shoes maybe twenty or thirty years ago? Sure. I mean, I, I sure enjoy it. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've probably more than anything enjoyed putting together an all-star band. And I, I hear the same thing. You know, like if, if I were to say to you, OK, you're going to go see a U2 show next week, you know, you're pretty certain that you're going to show up and the four Irish lads will be there and they'll be playing their hits and there'll be a light show and, and Bono will sound great and it'll be fine. OK, great. But if someone, if you say to someone, we're going to go see this trumpet player, it takes a lot of people to wrap their brain around, well, is it just like a trumpet or I'm not, you know, <laughs> you know, like, no, but it's got, you know, you know, two singers and a concert violinist and the best piano player in the world, and the best drummer in the world. And it's got an arc of all different varieties of, 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 of jazz and R&B and classical music and pop. And, you know, it's, it's a whole arc of a really, really fun, entertaining night. And it's also emotional when it needs to be. And it's the single thing that it's very difficult for me to explain it without sounding like a complete narcissistic egomaniac in the show. But it, it, I always smile afterwards when we run into people in the street and they're like, man, we saw you, you know, whatever. This is our eighth time seeing you. We just can't, we just come all the time because you just keep reworking the show with all these different players and it's just always so fantastic and we brought our friends and blah, blah, blah. And that, you know, I've, I've played shows before going way back in that 16 years where, you know, there'd be no one in the audience or very few. And and it's, 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 it's a grassroots uh, word of mouth situation that's stuck with us. And, uh, and we're not just, you know, a pop culture phenomenon. We, this is a real thing and, and we have real fans and it's super great.
Now, you already touched on it a little bit, but I, I get mad. I, I know uh, talking to people, uh, they've got uh, radio and Spotify and YouTube and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of people say, well, I don't really go to live shows anymore. You know, I, I just listen to recordings, which to me is missing the point. But I was just wondering, I mean, you you know, you've you've had uh, albums out. People have your stuff. They might have even seen you on the, you know, on, on uh, TV, on PBS or something like that. Sure, uh, sure. So why? OK, so I can, you know, sit at home and watch Chris Bode, why well, go to the theater and go see well, the, Chris Bode? The, 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 my records are completely different than a live show. See, first of all, it's my opinion when you make a record, you know, even if you look at like some of the most famous jazz records, the most famous one, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis, it's incredibly reserved. You know, you had this maturation by these great musicians that was recorded in 1959, but it's super subtle, and you can put the record on in your house as a lifestyle component, or you, if you're a musician, you want to dive into it deeper as a great work of art, you can do that too. So my records are meant to try to be that way. Like It's great playing, but it's also a mood piece of the record. You know, it's cinematic, it's romantic, whatever adjective you want to use for that sort of scenario. But when you come to a live show, you want to have your head blown off. I mean, you want to have all the beautiful stuff, but you want to feel like the visceral, basically, you know, very, very prodigy chops, whatever that stuff, content, fluidity, wow factor. You want to be taken on a roller coaster trip, and you cannot get that on a record. Because if you got that in a record, it would it would be too distracting. People, people when they go here music even even like pop music it doesn't move around all that stuff from pin drop quiet to come complete mania you know like it in from song to song or or from classical music to blah, blah, blah. it doesn't move around like that but for our show for what we've made this thing into basically a super high end variety act of great musicians that you will not find in any other band that is what serves us and you know i'm not a big social media guy myself but what happens is, is that all these people, they leave the show and they just exit poll on, on Twitter and they go, hey, man, we see he's coming to Atlanta. You got to go see the show. You got to go see the show. You got to go see the show. And it just builds and, it's, and it works out fantastic. And we go, you know, to somewhere like Taiwan or Poland or wherever, and there's just thousands of people. And you're like, man, how does this happen? Like, but, but it, 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 it's having an effect. And, uh, and I'm, it's something I'm incredibly proud of that we've been able to put together over this last 17 years. Now you uh, you talked about that variety and and for jazz obviously you have tons of people you're playing with people constantly so if you say oh you're a jazz trumpet player and you played with Herbie Hancock or Frank Sinatra that's that's somewhat to be expected but you've gone way beyond that I mean the the list of names like Paul Simon Sting Yo Yo Ma and uh, Lady Gaga and, and all the rest is there something about jazz or maybe just about your style of playing that, that lends so well to being that, that malleable and you can do a show which, which touches on so many different genres? Well, I, I, love, I love leaning the sound of my trumpet up to singers sometimes. You know, like stuff that I do with Josh Groban or Bocelli or something like that. It's, it's really, really fun for me because there's a, especially in the trumpet, they're, they're, they call it bel canto, but it's a, a singing quality, a lyrical quality. It's like a, a, a elasticity, like when you see a ballet person uh, jump and that sort of suspension in the air. And you, you want to go for that in, 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 uh, in trumpet, like I do. And, and that works great playing up against Bocelli or something like that. It's awesome. But, you know, those things sort of happen, uh, uh, you know, like with Josh or with Bocelli and, they just sort of happen over time. We become friends and then play. But but I've always loved playing with singers. Going back with Sting or Joni Mitchell or Sting, and 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 uh, and it and it's fun for me. Now a lot of jazz musicians they don't care two bits about that stuff. That uh, but but there's two things that are happening. While I was in all those individual bands, I saw how they constructed a show. I saw how they hired a band. I saw their appetite for touring. I mean. I mean, Sting, we went out 26 straight months. I think we had a month off in the 26 straight months. Now, albeit wow. it was very fancy style in a private jet and all that stuff, but you really, you know, there are a lot, there is a ton and ton and ton of really successful, you know, 
pop stars or jazz music. I mean, not jazz stars, but pop, you know, famous pop musicians that do back or whatever, you know, he'll do like a two, two year tour and then it'll take five years off, you know, and then you have the stalwarts that are out there all the time. James Taylor, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Bruce Springsteen, you know, and they, they're just out there all the time. And that's an old school mentality. And I sort of learned that, you know, and ingrained it in myself primarily through Sting. So is this is this what you want to be doing? I mean, the, the foreseeable future, are you thinking, oh, I've got, you know, five years till retirement or are you you're going uh, until you can't go anymore? I'm going until the I mean, the, the, the trumpet is a, a harsh mistress, you know, like and it, 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 it will tell me when it's no more. You know, I'm, I'm going to try to keep playing. I mean, I, I just uh, uh, did something with Doc Severinsen recently and uh uh, you know, he's 92 and still plays great, you know, and so there is hope out there, but you, you just never know, you know, there's so many things with the Trump is so physical and you have to practice it so many hours a day. I practice four or five hours a day, but you could have, you know, a back spasm or a shoulder cuff, you know, a rotator cuff or whatever it is, and it'll affect the trumpet, you know, and so, so I'm going, you know, I have no aspirations to be, you know, entrepreneur or have a clothing line or anything, any of that kind of nonsense. I want to play. I, I feel, you know, to, to have this sort of troubadour lifestyle and kind of you know, go from city to city and, and play is a, is, a, is a real privilege. So I want to do it as long as I can. There's no retirement at all. <laughs> that. Well, that's uh, that's great. And we're glad to have you up here in Worcester. Is this, do you know, is this your first time in Worcester? No, 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 no. You've we've been, you've been here. We've been we we we've been there many, many. I mean, I, I'm guessing five or something like that. You know, we it's a it's a real strong market for us, and uh, and 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 we're and we're looking forward to coming back. And and I always say from stage every night that is the single definition of success: is how long does it take a promoter to ask you back? And a lot of these places we go back every year, and uh, and it's a real gratifying feeling. Well, we're glad to have you back. We we are looking forward to the concert coming up in a little over a week, and we're hoping that there will be many more in the future. Uh, Chris Bodie, thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, yeah, excited for the Hanover Theater again, uh, May 10th, uh, coming up next Friday. Thank you so much. All the best to you, all right? All right. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.